Good evening, and welcome to the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin's 2022 Issues Briefing. This annual event provides updated information on high priority political issues. The purpose is to ensure that our official positions and the actions we take regarding those positions are well grounded in principles and evidence. This year's theme is Justice Matters. The subtitle declares that we can't and won't stop pursuing justice because it really matters. I'm Dorothy Sky, president of our Wisconsin League's board. It is my pleasure to introduce this first segment of this three-part briefing. Tonight's focus is on governmental justice and the topic is the problem of money in politics in our elections and how to solve it. To orient you to the logistics, this presentation will be recorded and will be available on the LWVWI website. To avoid background noise, please keep yourselves muted unless you're speaking. Put your questions in the chat anytime. They will be answered during the Q&A. To find the chat, if you're not familiar with it, click on the ellipsis, the three dots at the bottom of your screen and then click to open the self-explanatory chat box. Closed captions are enabled by clipping, uh, clicking on the CC icon on the bottom of your screen. It is fitting that we begin each session by acknowledging the original inhabitants of Wisconsin, whose lands were taken over by European immigrants usingly, using astoundingly unjust means. Throughout Wisconsin, we're on land that was home to indigenous peoples. Their descendants are included in the state's 12 identifiable native tribes or nations, 11 of which are federally recognized. The colored swaths on the, the map on the right hand, on the left hand side of the slide represent treaty lands as of the 1800s. And the tiny white blocks within, the, within them show the tribe's shrunken dominions today. In each, session, uh, in each session's land acknowledgement, I'll suggest a book and a website or two that could begin or enhance your connection with your region's indigenous tribe or nation. Your local league might consider this as a way to further justice in your locality by engaging with tribal members. Tonight's suggested book is An Indigenous People's History of the United States by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. This book dissociates you from the viewpoint of European fortune seekers looking west to pursue a di divine right of manifest destiny. Instead, you assume the viewpoint of members of an ancient, sophisticated, transcontinental civilization looking east towards an onslaught, onslaught of rapacious invaders and horrible epidemic diseases. Tonight's go to website is conservation vote voices and, na and no a native vote. There you'll learn how Wisconsin native vote works to combat historic voter disenfranchisement and contemporary barriers to voting by educating voters, registering people to vote and working to improve policies that impact native communities access to the polls. Here's tonight's program agenda. The League of Women Voters of Wisconsin, like Wisconsin Native Vote that I just referred to, is also all about empowering voters. So before we proceed with the keynote topic, I'll pass the virtual microphone to Eileen Newcomer, our State League's Voter Education Manager for a voter services recognition. Eileen? Thank you, Dorothy. Hi everyone, um, this is Eileen speaking now. Um, and I just wanna start off by saying what a pleasure it is to be in the same virtual space as all of you so soon after the election. Can we all just take a moment and pause and give a collective sigh of relief that some of our worst fears did not come to pass on Tuesday? I'm just gonna take a deep breath in and out and I encourage you all to do the same with me. I, for one, am, am so grateful that instead of scrambling into rapid response mode, 
we are able to take a moment to celebrate the fact that Wisconsin had number one voter turnout across the country. Let me say that again. We had the highest voter turnout in any state in our nation. And despite the barriers and restrictions to the ballot box that voters faced, they made their voices heard on election day. And again, we are back to being number one in voter turnout in the country. I cannot express how thrilled we are to see that so many voters made their voices heard in a way that worked for them, whether voting absentee, during early voting, or at the polls on election day. And we know that our league members and volunteers worked tirelessly to empower and encourage voters around the state. We all played a huge role in making this happen. And while I know that this election isn't over yet, provisional voters are still getting their documents in, counties are conducting their canvases, post-election equipment audits will be underway soon, and the Elections Commission will need to certify the results before they're final. It is so important that we take time to celebrate our successes and internalize what a win this is for voters and voting rights in our state. So if you would, please join me in celebrating by putting some words of congratulations to your fellow league members into the chat. I think we all deserve a quick pat on the back and to just really live and internalize again this celebration of this moment and what it means that during the midterms we had such high voter turnout. I also want to say thank you to the local league leaders and for Molly for putting together these slides that you see sh shown on the screen right now so we can get all get a sneak peek at the wonderful and creative things that league voter services teams did all around the state leading up to the midterm elections. You all held voter registration outreach events in new spaces in your communities, recruited, recruited poll workers to ensure all of our polling places had enough staff to open and process voters on election day, informed community members about the requirements to run for office, and then informed community members about where the candidates, uh, what their stances were on the issues uh, for, so voters knew what was gonna be on the ballot. And we did this through forums, interviews, voter guides, and a whole bunch of other really creative means. We worked with youth, including high school and college students, and made sure that they were ready to vote in this election. We also provided much needed resources to vote voters in various languages, including Spanish and Hmong, went door-to-door -door canvassing and distributed door hangers, called and texted voters, assisted eligible voters in county jails and encouraged voters with criminal convictions whose rights have been restored to use their voice and to vote, engage with the media to encourage more people to vote, recruited observers to ensure voters received fair treatment at the polls and made sure our election officials know that their work is appreciated so that they can continue on and do the good work that they need to do to keep our democracy functioning. You did all that and so much more. It would be impossible for me to list off everything we did and accomplished this year, but I think you all get it. We all did so much together and by collaborating together, we really are able to accomplish so much in our mission to empower voters and defend democracy. I am in awe of you and I'm incredibly proud to be among you all. If you ever wanna know what an election hero looks like, just take a look in the mirror. You all are election heroes. So thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you continue to do. Deborah, I believe at this point, I uh, turn it over to you. Thank you, Eileen. And you too are an election hero. Um, good evening and welcome to our kickoff meeting of the 2022 Issues Briefing. I am Deborah Cronmiller, the Executive Director of the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin. Each of the three sessions that we will be producing will focus on a topic of great importance to the League of Women Voters. Tonight, we are spotlighting, spotlighting as Dorothy said, money and politics. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan grassroots organization working to protect and expand voting rights and ensure everyone is represented in our democracy. We empower voters and defend democracy through advocacy, education, and litigation to ensure our political systems represent the people and are fair to all involved. 
The theme of the issues briefing sessions brought to you tonight, Saturday and Monday, will be Justice Matters. Justice is about our values. It's about why we defend people's rights, the right to vote, to clean water and air, to equal rights, to reproductive rights, and for all of the work that we do. In understanding words, I often turn to the experts, dictionaries. Justice, as you might imagine, is not singular in its meaning. Merriam-Webster defines justice in numerous ways. The maintenance or administration of what is just, especially by the impartial adjustment of conflicting claims or the assignment of merited rewards or punishment. The definition goes on to elaborate that justice is also the quality of being just, impartial or fair, the principle or ideal of just dealing or right action, conformity to a principle or ideal, righteousness, the quality of conforming to law, conformity to truth, fact, or reason, correctness. In a democracy, politicians are expected to represent each person equally, regardless of their financial status. The principle of one person, one vote means that no matter who we are, our rights to healthcare, education, housing, and other basic needs are equally important. Money in politics complicates this system. When politicians receive large financial contributions from organizations, corporations, campaigns, or individuals, they are inclined to be more responsive to those needs. This puts the voices of everyday Americans at a disadvantage. The involvement of money in our elections is a huge barrier for everyday Americans who run for public office but lack significant financial re resources. Every person has a right to run for public office. But because of the role money plays in our elections, not everyone has an equal shot. At the League of Women Voters, we are committed to creating a more transparent and equitable small dollar funding system for elections. So all voters are valued no matter how much they can contribute to the candidate of their choice. Making sure that candidates are elected based on their positions instead of their funds and communities are empowered over organizations. Because of Supreme Court decisions like Citizens United versus the Federal Elections Commission, corporations can now spend unlimited funds promoting individual candidates and political parties. As a result, elections are becoming increasingly expensive. The 2020 presidential election was the priciest to date with costs estimated at over $10 billion and small donors, those who spend less than $200 accounting for a mere 22% of contributions. The current midterm election that we just came out of was also quite costly estimated to cost also more than $10 billion. This huge amount of political spending is putting big money donors at a major advantage. As politicians look to gain and keep their financial support by promoting policies that meet the needs of their donors more so than the needs of their constituents. The League works with our coalition partners, grassroots organizers and everyday Americans to promote policies that would make our campaign finance system more transparent and less entangled with dark money. These include bills like the Freedom to Vote, John R. Lewis Act, which would shine a light in the shine a light on the influence of money in elections and increase financial transparency. Leaks across the United States are fighting legal cases and promoting legislation to oppose dark money and increase financial transparency in our elections. The League of Women Voters of the United States supports a bipartisan bill entitled the Honest Ads Act, 
This bill would increase transparency around online political advertising. It would decrease foreign influence over our election by banning foreign nationals from purchasing online political ads and require online platforms to maintain public databases of, pub, of political ads. Justice in the league takes on many iterations. Like our commitment to nonpartisanship, all leagues are required to have a DEI policy. The work of creating a truly diverse, equitable, and inclusive league is much more difficult than simply adopting the DEI policy. Fostering a league that is diverse, equitable, and inclusive requires organizational and personal self-reflection. Leagues should actively work toward diversity, equity, and inclusion in membership, culture, mission, and action. And remember that the policy prohibits both intentional and unintentional discrimination. A successful league is representative of its community. League members should also be cognizant that this cultural transformation is a journey we are taking together to ensure our sustainability and reputation as champions of rights, voting rights, reproductive rights, human rights, economic and social justice. Given the cultural context of our time and place, it is unlikely that any of us has been untouched by the societal conditioning that upholds a complicated web of advantages and disadvantages according to different identities and characteristics. While the work of becoming aware of and responsible for our specific conditioning looks different for each individual, everyone has a responsibility for understanding their role in achieving a diverse, equitable, and inclusive lead. When education is necessary to understand that role, this education must be concurrent with action, not in place of it. So with this issues briefing, we are emphasizing the importance of justice to our organization, to our communities, and to ourselves. Justice is a complicated concept, but one that is so important to an organization like ours that accomplishes so much of our work through volunteerism, our advocacy for our adopted positions, and our commitment to strong, healthy communities through partnerships. Thank you for joining us for our 2020, 2022 issues briefing. It's now my pleasure to introduce Melanie Ramey. Melanie is currently the Vice President of the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin Board of Directors where she has held numerous positions for over the past 30 years. Her commitment to the League, our mission, and our members is nothing short of exemplary. Melanie? Thank you very much, Deborah. You know, when I think about justice, I really think it comes down to just us, just us as people and how we act and how we interact with our government. So I think that when we think in the broad term of justice, we need to really think about it in terms of our own behaviors and how we act in just manners. And so it's really quite fitting that here we are two days past the midterm elections and that we deal with this subject of governmental justice, particularly the money in politics and how this really affects our elections. And is there a way to deal with it? We talk about it a lot and people run on platforms, political platforms of uh, doing something about uh, this particular problem, but yet nothing seems to change. So that's why we are particularly fortunate to have with us this evening, Matt Rothschild. Matt is the executive director of the Democracy Campaign. And I know no other person who has been tracking money and politics in this state and others uh, any longer or more ardently than has Matt. And so we're really fortunate for having his expertise with us this evening to talk with us about this subject and particularly his ideas of how we can per perhaps solve it. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, if you will click on the icon at the bottom of the page for the chat room and put your questions to Matt in the chat room. Uh, at the conclusion of his presentation, I will then uh, convey the questions to him and so we can have a more robust discussion. 
So without further ado, it's my pleasure to present Matt Rothschild. Why, thank you, Melanie. Uh, it's great to be with everybody uh, here. Good evening. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for inviting me to speak with you tonight. Uh, and I also want to thank Ellen and Melanie for putting the arm on me and making sure I, you know, I, I, I got here. Uh, and I'm here. And I want to thank Molly, too, for, for helping out with logistics. Uh, I'd like to talk tonight about the urgent need for campaign finance reform. I also want to talk about all the money that flooded into Wisconsin this election cycle, more than $300 million. You know, the governor's race cost more than $100, $100 million. Uh, and we're, we haven't stopped uh, uh, and finished counting all the dough yet. Uh, and, the gov and the race for Senate cost about $200 million. I mean, that's just an incredible amount of money here in Wisconsin. This money enriched the media consultants. It enriched the radio and TV stations. It enriched YouTube, but it didn't enrich you, didn't enrich me, and it didn't enrich our political dialogue. Instead, it splattered mud on all our screens. And I'm sure you were as sick of that mud as I was. Some of those ads I need to say at the outset were reprehensible and racist, especially the ads paid for by a group called Wisconsin Truth Pack, which was founded by and primarily funded by three billionaires, Diane Hendricks of ABC Supply, the richest woman in Wisconsin, who's infamous for urging Scott Walker to turn Wisconsin into a red state and a right to work state, and then Richard and Elizabeth Eline of Lake Forest, Illinois, who own the Uline Corporation and are huge donors to Republican candidates across the country. Diane Hendricks and the Elines also happen to be the two families that reaped $200 million each in just one year alone from that tax benefit that Ron Johnson insisted on putting into the tax code. So now Wisconsin Truth Pack spent $29 million to reelect Ron Johnson. What is that, a 15% tip? and it smacks of corruption. Let me give you another example. In the Tim Michaels race, he self-funded, providing $17 million to his own campaign, about 75%. Uh, and as uh, Deborah was suggesting, you know, who among us can do that? Who among us has a treasure that allows us to, to run for an office without raising much money? But then he did raise some money and he leaned on his brothers. They each maxed out in their uh, direct donations to him. The most you can give someone in Wisconsin who's running for governor is $20,000. That's the legal limit. It doubled in 2015 because Republicans rewrote the law and let people give, rich people that is, give twice that amount. Uh, it's way too high, in my opinion, and needs to be lower even than $10,000. But anyway, the legal limit in Wisconsin is $20,000. Two of Michael's brothers gave that legal limit to him. Uh, and what did the Michaels brothers do once they maxed out? Did they uh, just leave it off at that? No, they found a way uh, uh, around the ceiling on how much you could give to individual candidates. And how did they do that? Well, they turned around and gave $1.5 million each to the Republican Party of Wisconsin, which shortly thereafter gave Michaels $3 million in change. Imagine that. Basically, they turned the Republican Party of Wisconsin into a laundromat, and they made a mockery of the limit that we uh, impose on contributions to candidates. But they were able to get away with that because in the rewrite of our campaign finance law in 2015, uh, the Republican legislature and Scott Walker uh, tore down the ceiling completely on donations to political parties. There used to be a de facto $10,000 limit on what uh, any person could give to a political party. If you gave $10,000 to Walker, you couldn't give a dime to anybody running for the state Senate or state legislature. Uh, same thing on the Democratic side, but they completely tore down the ceiling and now the sky's the limit. And a lot of people both uh, on the Republican side and the Democratic side are, run, are writing six figure, seven figure checks to the political parties. And that comes with the risk of corruption and also the risk of undue influence by the multimillionaire or billionaire class over who gets elected and what laws are passed and what policies are pursued. And this is a bipartisan problem. I know I used two examples there on the Republican side. Let's take a look at, at the Evers side. Evers' uh, biggest donors, well, his biggest donors, the Democratic Party of Wisconsin, and that's because super rich folks on the uh, Democratic side can give unlimited amounts of money 
to the Democratic Party of Wisconsin, and then that uh, party can shovel that money over to, to Evers. Uh, our last tally shows him getting 41% of his total from the Democratic Party of Wisconsin. And he also has gotten, uh, you know, big donors, $20,000 uh, donors. The most recent look that we did at the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign, and we do campaign finance nine to five, five days of the week, uh, we looked at his 10 biggest donors uh, in, in a period of six weeks this fall, uh, uh, who each gave him $20,000. I'm going to just read this list. Fred Eichner of Chicago, chairman of NewsWeb Corporation, Amy Bloom of Winnetka, Illinois, a public relations consultant, Maura McCarthy of Wayland, Massachusetts, an agent for Road Trip LLC, whatever that is, Leslie Williams of Bedford Hills, New York, a retired attorney, Anthony Safarth Lechner of Milwaukee, a software engineer, Rebecca Henderson of La Jolla, California, a retiree, Francis Hellman of Berkeley, California, a physicist, Pierre Cremieux of Brookline, Massachusetts, president of Analysis Group, Leonard Gumport of Pasadena, California, owner of the Gumport Law Firm, Wendy Munger of Pasadena, California, former corporate lawyer. Well, what pops out from this list that I just read to you? All but one of these big donors is not even from Wisconsin. Why should super rich folks in California or in New York or in Massachusetts or in Illinois be helping to determine who's the next governor of Wisconsin? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, and, and, and we're seeing this all over the country, not just here in Wisconsin, as Deborah suggested. Nationally, the billionaire class is playing in the political arena now more than ever before. Thanks to Citizens United, the 2010 U.S. Supreme Court decision that said corporations and the super rich can spend unlimited amounts of money to tell us who to vote for or who not to vote for, so long as they're not coordinating with the candidate. But it wasn't just the Citizens United decision. Uh, you know, there were other decisions. Uh, there was the 2014 decision that uh, tore down uh, the aggregate limit on what an individual could give. Uh, and so, you know, there are real problems. And because of these Supreme Court decisions, the super rich and corporations have much more of a say over our elections than ever before. Just this year, according to the Washington Post, uh, they were uh, doing a study on billionaires playing in the political arena. Republicans have many more billionaires in this game, uh, the report uh, from the Washington Post said. Of the 25 top donors this cycle, 18 are Republican, and they have outspent Democrats by $200 million. Billionaires make up 20% of total Republican donations compared with 14.5% of Democratic donations. But billionaires, as you can see, are, are playing on both sides of the field. But our, uh, our democracy should not be a tug of war between a handful of super rich billionaires on the left and a handful of super rich billionaires on the right. In a real democracy, we'd all have an equal tug on the road, and we just don't. And I think everybody who uh, is listening to this or uh, would read uh, what I have to say on this would agree just from a visceral level. We all know that you and I don't have as much say about who gets elected, about what laws are passed as the folks who are writing the huge checks. They're the ones who get in the door. They're the ones who get the ear of the politician. We don't, and that's a real problem for our democracy. Our voices and our choices are being drowned out by the billionaires. So what do we do about it? Well, first we need to elect folks here in Wisconsin who are committed to fixing the problem. Uh, we've been working at the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign with Senator Chris Larson and, and Representative Lisa Subek, who've introduced uh, in the last two sessions model legislation that would fix some of the problems from that terrible rewrite of our campaign finance law back in 2015. By the way, one of the problems in that rewrite uh, is that Scott Walker and the Republican legislature gave corporations for the first time ever, uh, the, uh, or certainly the first time in the last hundred years, the ability to give directly to political parties and legislative campaign committees. They did put a limit on that. They're supposed to only give $12,000 to the political parties. And those parties aren't supposed to use that money for candidates, but that money is fungible. So the parties can use that money to pay salaries. And then they'd have you know, $12,000 to throw into advertising. So it, uh, that's a, uh, a distinction that really doesn't make a difference. 
Uh, corporations now are giving money to the political parties in ways that they weren't able to uh, prior to 2015. Uh, unfortunately, there are not enough legislators in Madison committed to this cause because uh, you know they figured out a way to make the system work for themselves and the current campaign finance system. And because of gerrymandering, because they don't have to worry too much about paying a price at the polls, even though the vast majority of Wisconsinites don't like this problem of money in politics. And let's look at gerrymandering for a second, if you don't mind. On Tuesday, Governor Evers won statewide 51-48, but Republicans actually gained seats in the legislature and hold almost a two-thirds majority. That's crazy. Even crazier is the fact that, here's an illustration of gerrymandering. In three counties in Northwestern Wisconsin, Evers won 57% of the vote. And these counties are adjacent to each other. Douglas County, Ashland County, Bayfield County. The citizens of those counties now have no representatives in the legislature. They don't have a state senator who's a Democrat. So 57% of the people in that population are totally unrepresented. They don't have a, 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 a state assembly person either. And you know, our founders fought the Revolutionary War over fair representation. And now the citizens in those three counties, they don't have it. And a lot of other citizens in Wisconsin don't have it because of gerrymandering. So we need to ban gerrymandering in Wisconsin and we might get a chance to do that if the Wisconsin Supreme Court flips after the election coming up in April, but that's a talk for another day. Uh, one thing we need to do on the campaign finance front, other than changing the law here in Wisconsin, uh, is to uh, pass the Freedom to Vote Act, uh, as Deborah pointed out. Uh, and an even more fundamental thing we need to do is to amend the U.S. Constitution to say finally, once and for all, that you know what, corporations actually aren't persons and money actually isn't speech. And so that means overturning Citizens United. But again, Citizens United is just a shorthand for overturning a whole bunch of wrong-headed Supreme Court decisions dating back to the late 19th century when they first said that corporations uh, are persons. Uh, and then there were more recent decisions in 1976, Buckley versus Vallejo that said money is speech and then there was Citizens United uh, and there were a bunch of other ones uh, after Citizens United too. The good news is there's a mass movement here in Wisconsin and across the country to amend the constitution to declare that corporations aren't persons and that money isn't speech. In 167 communities in Wisconsin, uh, these communities have passed referendums or resolutions. Uh, these are advisory, of course, but saying that they, the people of that community, want to amend the US Constitution and overturn Citizens United. A lot of this work is being done by the Wisconsin United to amend. Uh, they're spearheading this effort and George Penn is one of the primary activists there you, uh, if you're not in a community that has passed one of these referendums or resolutions, you can contact George Penn at George Penn, that's P-E-N-N, georgepenn51 at gmail.com. Uh, tell him you heard me uh, giving this talk and he wants me to give out his email so he can continue that great work of Wisconsin United to amend and get more communities on board. You know, these efforts won't succeed overnight, but over time, uh, I think that's what we need to do fundamentally to solve the problem uh, of money and politics. Right now we're in the wild, wild west. You know, there used to be an expression in Wisconsin uh, that uh, super rich people kind of like to use uh, if they were playing in the political arena. And that expression was, I've maxed out. And sometimes they used uh, that expression uh, not uh, with a great deal of honesty or sincerity, because if they'd spent their $10,000, which was the total limit prior to 2015, and a candidate contacted them, they'd say, oh, you know, I'd love to help you out, but you know what, I've maxed out, I just can't, I'm so sorry. Well, uh, they can't even say that anymore, because actually there is no way to max out in Wisconsin. If you're a super rich person, you can always give money to the parties. If you're a super rich person, you can always give money to the dark money groups that Deborah mentioned. And you know, those dark money groups, they don't use the magic words of vote for or vote against a specific candidate, but they will tell you, uh, you know, call up this candidate who's a miserable person and tell them not to be such a miserable person. Here's the number 608, whatever. And, and that's just as they might just as well have been telling you not to vote for that candidate, right? It, it's the same thing as saying don't vote for that candidate, but they don't use the magic words, so they don't have to disclose who their donors are. 
so they can hide behind some bushes and splatter mud on your screens and we don't know who's paying for the mud. And uh, another thing that the Wisconsin Supreme Court said unbelievably is that candidates can coordinate with these dark money groups. This was their decision in 2015 that let Scott Walker off the hook from the special prosecutor because the special prosecutor was pursuing Scott Walker because he had been coordinating with some of these outside groups like Wisconsin Club for Growth and Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce, uh, raising money from big donors who would write checks to those groups and then Walker would tell those groups who to work for. Well, the Wisconsin Supreme Court said that the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution forbids the state of Wisconsin from banning coordination between candidates and dark money groups. So now it's okay. You know, if I'm running for governor uh, and I've got some billionaire friend, I can tell my billionaire friend, you know, I'd love your $20,000, but I got an even better idea. Why don't you give $2 million to this group I'm working with? It's called Badgers for Eternal Victory. Uh, you know, give $2 million to Bev. And uh, the kicker is, Bev doesn't have to disclose that you gave him a, a single dime. Uh, you know, and so this is an outrageous uh, end around our ability to impose reasonable limits on individual donations and to have adequate disclosure so people know who is paying off the candidates and who may be getting a reward when that person gets elected. So that's what we got to do about this issue of money and politics. We've got to change our laws here in Wisconsin. We've got to amend the U.S. Constitution. We've got to get better people on the Supreme Court of Wisconsin uh, so that uh, we can have a much more just system of campaign finance reform. But if you'll allow me a couple of minutes, the issue of money and politics and the issue of gerrymandering, they're not the only issues we need to tackle if we want justice and freedom and democracy in America. Right now, we've got also to take on the anti-democracy movement. It's a movement that consists of the Trump cult, white nationalists, irrationalists, like the COVID deniers and the uh, November of 2020 deniers and the climate deniers. And there's also this far right media ecosystem that feeds toxic propaganda into the brains and into the veins of tens of millions of Americans every day. This is a real problem for us. Uh, and it's an imminent problem. Fortunately, it looks like a little of the air went out of the anti-democracy movement on Tuesday, and, and that's a healthy sign if it bears out. Uh, but here in Wisconsin, we saw the bite that racism is still taking out of our civil society. We saw it in all its ugliness in the Ron Johnson campaign, uh, a campaign that made Mandela Barnes, uh, tried to make Mandela Barnes into the scariest black man in Wisconsin. Uh, you know, he's different. He's dangerous. That was one of the ads from the Wisconsin Truth Pack. And sadly, it worked here in Wisconsin. That's why Evers did better than Mandela Barnes. Let's be real. So we need to do more to combat racism right here in Wisconsin. And we also need to beat back the assault on women's rights and freedom, which the far rightists on the US Supreme Court are leading. And we need to address and redress the problem of economic inequality, which is only getting worse in this country. Now, all this might seem like a lot of work because it is a lot of work. But that's the work we got to do. And it's best to do it with friends and it's best to do it within organizations like all you are. That way you don't burn out, which isn't good for you. And it isn't good for the pro-democracy movement either. But if you do the work with friends and within organizations, you can do this work for a lifetime. That's what I've done anyway. And the good news is that in Wisconsin right now, there is a tremendous and unified and broad-based pro-democracy nonprofit sector, which the League of Women Voters is a big part of. We're all doing the work. We're all working together. We're all strategizing together. We're writing op-eds together. We're doing press conferences together. We're organizing rallies together. We're sharing each other's stuff on social media. And we're just generally rowing in the same direction. And because of this, I'm confident that we'll succeed in the not too distant future. As the great Irish poet Seamus Haney wrote in The Cure at Troy, once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice rises up and hope and history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge, he said. Believe, he said, that a further shore is reachable from here. And I'm hoping, as I'm sure you are, for that great sea change. And I do believe that this further shore is reachable from here if we keep rowing in the same direction. I also take inspiration from one of my Wisconsin heroes, fighting Bob LaFollette, who said a century ago, 
the cure for the ills of democracy is more democracy. So let's take that cure and let's demand more democracy right here in Wisconsin and around the country. Thanks very much. I'm happy to take questions. I am okay, Matt. Yeah, there's a first question is from someone who says, I recently learned that Wisconsin was in January the 21st state to sign on to the Conference of States. What has this group been doing here since, and what are the impacts for Wisconsinites? So, if my memory serves me, and it doesn't always serve me, the Conference of States is an effort to get a new constitutional convention started. Uh, and uh, if that's what the question is about, um, this is a tricky thing uh, because part of me, the philosopher student of me says, look, I never signed the social contract. None of us ever signed the social contract. Why don't we get together and figure out among ourselves as citizens, what we want in this country, how we want our democracy to work. But uh, if there is a new constitutional convention, uh, there is no uh, guarding against the real risk that a lot of the good things in our current constitution, like the Bill of Rights, like the separation of powers, uh, would go the wayside. I mean, if you start from scratch, uh, everything can go overboard. So uh, even though I'm ambivalent about it, I, on balance, am against a new constitutional convention. And the next question is, are there any realistic pathways to allow Wisconsin citizens to put initiatives and for binding referendums on the ballot, would it require amending the state constitution? Any groups working on this? Uh, yes, it would require amending the constitution. Now remember, uh, Governor Evers proposed after the Dobbs decision that we uh, that they the legislature start the uh, the process of amending the Wisconsin Constitution to allow for binding referendums. I'm in favor of binding referendums. I think it's weird and odd that Wisconsin doesn't have binding referendums because we were a leader of the progressive movement fighting Bob LaFollette and others. Uh, and uh, governor, there was a governor McGovern back then who also was one of the leaders of this effort way back in the early part of the 20th century. But uh, for some reason, Wisconsin didn't get binding referendums. Ohio has them. That's why Ohio was able to stop uh, their version of Act 10. Uh, remember, the Ohio governor was copying Scott Walker. The folks in Ohio, led by the labor union, said, we don't want that. And they, had put, they put a referendum on the ballot after getting enough signatures. And so they overturned the, the uh, Act 10 version in Ohio. In Michigan, they have binding referendums and they were able to ban gerrymandering in Michigan. So, you know, it's been working in Ohio and Michigan. I think it could work here in Wisconsin. So I'm very much in favor of that, but yes, it would take a constitutional amendment, which requires the passage of a bill in two successive legislative sessions, and then it would go to the voters. The next question is, are there any current Wisconsin legislators who are publicly um, supporting some of these changes needed in campaign finance reform, dark money influence, and so forth. Yes, uh, you know, actually, there are a lot uh, on the Democratic side. We've been working with Senator Chris Larson, as I mentioned, Lisa Subek, and there are a bunch of other ones. Francesca Hong is in favor, uh, and I know there are others as well, Katrina Shanklin and others. Um, it's been hard to get Republican co sponsors on this. We have gotten Republican co-sponsors on gerrymandering. Todd Novak has been with us every session. Uh, and there are a few other Republicans who come on for banning gerrymandering. But on the campaign finance issue, it's hard. There was one, there's a Republican senator up in the Green Bay area, Rob Coles, who voted against the uh, campaign finance rewrite in 2015. And I give him a lot of credit for that. He was the only Republican to stick his neck out on it. And he was quoted in the papers the next day by saying, you know, my mom hated the corruption of money in politics. And I just couldn't bring myself to vote for this thing. And it just struck me, you know, sometimes our parents are still in our ears, years and sometimes decades after they're gone. Um, another question is, do you support uh, in the uh, financing individual candidates uh, by individuals or by government financing of campaigns as is common in, Southern, in some other countries? 
Yeah, we've long been in favor of the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign of full public financing of elections. They had this in a lot of other advanced mm -hmm. industrial democracies around the world. And uh, we think that is the best way to go to, to put a ceiling on the spending, to stop the corruption, uh, and uh, have a much more decent uh, campaign climate. You know, one of the problems with these outside groups, uh, they outspend, and I think they did in the governor's race and in the Senate race here, they outspend the candidates themselves. And they can be much dirtier than the candidates themselves because uh, the candidate can say, oh, I wasn't in favor of that ad. That's not my ad. And I can't coordinate with those groups, at least the express advocacy groups. So uh, you got to talk to the groups who ran that ad, not me. I had nothing to do with it. And it, it's disingenuous, probably, because some of the people running these groups are former aides or uh, oftentimes former aides of the candidates themselves. But uh, look, I, I do think we need full public financing. Uh, and maybe we can get that can get that faster and we can amend the U.S. Constitution. Uh, you spoke a lot about the tremendous amounts of money that some people uh, have contributed. And this uh, person comments, are these people so rich? that it's cheaper to pay a candidate 20,000 or more than to just pay their taxes like the rest of us do. Yeah, I mean, this is cushion change for a lot of these rich folks. You know, $20,000 is, or even a million dollars to the Democratic Party or a million dollars to the Republican Party. These are billionaires. Uh, and it, it just doesn't make a dent uh, you know, in their lives to be spending this kind of money. You know, so, you know, billionaires are, you know, going up into the atmosphere in spaceships now. So, you know, what is a little bit of money to a to a candidate if they're fascinated with politics? Uh, the other thing, you know, people have raised questions about a, a constitutional convention. Uh, do you have any idea of uh, Mr. Penn and, and these people, how they can would want one uh, set up? You know, I mean, who would be a delegate? How would these kinds of things be done? I think. Uh, there's a lot of apprehension given the time we're in that how this might actually work. Yeah, I don't know that George Penn is in favor of a constitutional convention. Uh, he and Wisconsin United to amend as the Wisconsin democracy campaign is. We're in favor of amending the U.S. Constitution the old-fashioned way, which is to get the uh, both the Senate and the House to pass uh, by two-thirds margin, and then it goes to the states and three-quarters of the states ratify. That's usually how we amend the Constitution, and that's the way I much prefer. Uh, do you know if um, opensecrets.org is a reliable source of information? Totally. I was there today for about a half hour. So this is uh, the, the Center for Responsive Politics runs opensecrets.org. Uh, we don't track the money in federal races at the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign. So actually, we didn't track the money in the Mandela Barnes, Ron Johnson race. I had to go to opensecrets.org to get that information. But their information is really solid, uh, very reliable. They're nonpartisan. They've got the, uh, the money data on everybody who's running, whether they're Republican or Democrat or independent. Uh, Matt, based on your research, what would be the best way to structure public financing of campaigns? For example, can you give some specific details? Well, sure. I mean, a candidate would have to get sufficient number of signatures before they could qualify for public financing. I couldn't just, you know, say, hey, I'm Matt Rothschild. I want to run for uh, state senate here. Give me, you know, $200,000 or give me $500,000. Uh, I'd have to get, you know, whatever, five or 10% uh, of the signatures uh, of citizens in the district where I want to run or whatever the number is that seems reasonable. Not too high a number, but also not too low so that just, you know, anyone can just wave their hands and get money. You'd have to be a serious candidate with some level of support that you can demonstrate. Um, and some people were asking about when would... Uh this uh, particular presentation be available? And the response is it's gonna be on our YouTube and that everyone will be sent a copy of it by email next week. So uh, we can certainly uh, refer back to it for uh, some information that may we forget. Uh, also, I'm curious about uh, the campaigns that are coming up in terms of ways to vote. We see that uh, other states have changed to ranking uh, voting and, and different kinds of ways of choosing uh, winners. And I'm wondering what your thought is about some of these 
uh, different ways of voting for people. You know, I'm in favor of ranked choice voting. I think it, it, it gives the voter more of a voice, more choices, more reflects their preferences more accurately than just, uh, you know, the vote for one candidate. If you can rank your candidates by your favorites, you know, here's my first favorite, here's my second one. Uh, it gets rid of the spoiler effect, for instance, you know, back in the Ralph Nader 2020 campaign, you could have voted for Ralph Nader and your second vote could have been for Al Gore if you were in Florida, for instance, and they had ranked choice voting there. And once your first choice uh, gets eliminated, your second choice becomes your first choice. And then uh, you can have a result that's more to your liking, like uh, folks who voted green in Florida and have been embarrassed about it ever since that there had been ranked choice voting you know, Al Gore would have been president of the United States. Uh, this person says that the gerrymandered maps reduce representative government. What do you think that voters can really do about this? Well, there's another, this is another uh, area of hope that I have because at the grassroots, there's been this tremendous grassroots movement here in Wisconsin that has just boomed and blossomed over the last five years, fit this little map over my shoulder shows that 56 communities in Wisconsin have passed referendums or resolutions, and sometimes both saying they want the legislature to pass a bill to give us independent nonpartisan redistricting in Wisconsin, uh, like they have in Iowa. Iowa solved this problem 40 years ago. The Republican legislature passed a bill 40 years ago in Iowa that said, you know what, we, the political party in power, we're not going to be the ones drawing the maps. We're going to let career civil servants draw the maps with specific criteria that forbids them from uh, drawing a map that's uh, intentionally favoring one party or another or one uh, elected official or another. And so it's worked great in Iowa, it can work great here. Uh, another person asks, do you think that some of these terrible ads that we saw during this campaign uh, will perhaps motivate people to want to do something about campaign financing? Yeah, you know, I sure hope so. Um, and also, I think people should contact their TV stations and radio stations. Now, TV stations and radio stations are required by the Telecommunications Act of 1934 or 1935 to run the ads that candidates give them. Uh, they have an obligation. They can't turn those down, but they can turn down advertisements from outside groups like this Wisconsin Truth Pack uh, or any other outside group. They don't have to run those ads. But, it, you know, Christmas comes early for the radio and TV stations at election time, and they're just making unbelievable amounts of money from all these ads. So they have a, a vested interest to run the ads, no matter how disgusting they are. Uh, the weird thing about that Telecommunications Act of 1934-35 is that a candidate can actually lie in their ad and they have to run that. I mean, the, uh, the FCC wouldn't allow a, a, an advertiser for any other product to lie uh, in their ads, but candidates can lie. And here in Wisconsin, uh, I can remember Ed Garvey being slandered by Bob Kasten when Garvey was running against Kasten for Senate. Uh, Garvey used to work at the uh, football players union and Kasten was insinuating that Garvey had embezzled money from the football players union or something, which was just a total blatant lie. And the advertiser had to run it. Garvey's only choice was to sue for uh, defamation, which he did. Uh, he won the lawsuit, didn't get any damages from Kasten, even though Kasten was rich. I don't know why he settled that way, but Kasten admitted that he had lied. Uh, but that's, you know, after the race, and that's no solace to Ed Garvey, may rest in peace, because Garvey didn't, didn't want Kasten to apologize. He wanted Kasten not to be senator. <laughs> Garvey wanted to be senator himself. So uh, there's, a, there's an interesting problem there with advertising. But that was a little bit of a tangent. I'm sorry. You know, and there seems to be a mantra among advertisers that negative ads work. And so, you know, whether this is uh, uh, true, and I guess it has certainly been proven in some ways, but this is sort of what they also keep on producing these kinds of things. Uh, another person has said, have you discovered any disadvantages or unintended consequences of ranked uh, choice voting? Uh, well, first, negative ads do work. I mean, look what happened to, to Mandela Barnes. These racist ads drove doubled his negatives, especially among independents. Uh, and that's why they keep running these negative ads. 
uh, ranked choice voting, the problem would be uh, that it, it pushes, it would push candidates. Some people would say this is a good thing. Others would say it's not such a good thing. It would push all, most of the candidates toward the middle. There'd be less partisanship, which might be good. But on the other hand, maybe you'd lose uh, someone who is a real visionary. For instance, uh, so, you know, in a crowded uh, primary, Democratic primary last time, it was conceivable that Bernie Sanders was going to win. And then Klobuchar got out and Buttigieg got out at the same time. Uh, I heard that they were pushed out by uh, the Obama folks because they wanted they didn't know they wanted Biden to win because they didn't think Sanders had a chance. Uh, and I don't know if that's uh, whether Sanders would have had a chance or not, but Sanders certainly had policy prescriptions that were bolder than uh, what Joe Biden was running on at the time. And, and maybe that uh, by sh pushing people toward the middle, uh, you're uh, lessening the chances of having uh, bold proposals um, getting enacted or a uh, candidate with bold proposals getting enacted. So I've heard that that's one of the problems, potential problems with ranked choice voting. I discussed that I do have a chapter on ranked choice voting. Here's a plug in my book, 12 Ways to Save Democracy in Wisconsin, which also has a long chapter on campaign finance reform. I actually was in the Senate gallery the evening in November, 2015, when the Senate passed the horrible rewrite of campaign finance. I was about the only person up there except for a Capitol Police officer and a young <laughs> age there. So it wasn't a great night. Do you know if it's correct that out-of-state funds basically elected former Supreme Court Justice Gableman? I don't know if it was uh, out-of-state funds. My recollection is that a ton of that money came from Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce. And that there were also racist ads in that campaign. Remember, it was against Lewis Butler, the first African American to sit on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Uh, and Gableman and uh, the Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce were running ads that were a racist about Lewis Butler. Why do you think that Democrats failed to initiate a nonpartisan <laughs> redistricting commission like I was? during the many years that they held the majority in the legislature? Well, this was disgraceful because in 2009, the Democrats had the governor's seat. Jim Doyle was governor and they held the uh, state assembly in the state Senate. They didn't have huge margins in those chambers, but they did have the majority and they could have done, they could then have banned gerrymandering uh, right then and there and passed a bill to adopt the Iowa model whereby our legislative reference bureau staff would be drawing the maps with specific criteria that would forbid them from helping out one party or another. They also, by the way, could have gotten rid of that 1849 law of banning abortions in Wisconsin when they had the power to do it. And for the life of me, I can't understand why the Democrats, when they had the power, didn't do those two things. Um, I think you did uh, respond to the question about uh, candidate financing uh, versus government financing and why you preferred it. Uh, I think maybe some people missed your answer. Yeah, I just think full public financing is the best way to go uh, to ensure uh, that there's a ceiling on the amount of money that super rich people can throw around. Uh, I don't think politics should be a game uh, uh, that is primarily played by the super rich. And unfortunately, that's what's happening right now in Wisconsin and across the country. Um, how does Open Secrets find the information they publish and who finances their efforts? Uh, I don't know who finances their efforts. I imagine they will say so at their website. We say on our website who finances us. Um, a lot of the information is public information. The express advocacy groups are required. These are the groups, so-called independent expenditure groups. These are the groups that tell you explicitly, vote for this candidate or don't vote for that candidate. They have to disclose who their donors are uh, to the uh, federal government and to state governments. And so the staff at Open Secrets goes to the websites of the federal government and the state government uh, groups and uh, collects that information and puts it on their website. Uh, Jay Schwartz has commented that United to Amend has been working throughout Wisconsin for 10 years and welcomes new members. 
and she has been the legal counsel for UTA and uh, you can contact uh, uh, Jean at the um, email jschwartz at gmail.com. And so if some of you are more interested in the mending process we've been discussing, you can certainly uh, get involved. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question that's a little unrelated maybe. It has to do with polling. And uh, polling has played such a, a um, part in uh, getting people to vote and not vote, I guess. What's your take on it in general? Because it seems like, uh, you know, a lot of times they miss it as uh, often as they get it correct in terms of their predictions. Yeah, I don't think they've gotten it right for a while. And I don't think there's been adequate uh, industry-wide uh, uh, self-reflection uh, about how come they're not doing a better job. Here in Wisconsin, you know, the Marquette Law School poll, when it showed Barnes falling like a rock, uh, I don't I don't know if that was an outlier, whether or that was an accurate snapshot, whether or that was a distortion. But I do think it took the wind out of the sails of the Mandela Barnes campaign. And it was amazing to me that that the Barnes campaign was able to bounce back from that in part. He had two really good debates, in my opinion, unlike Governor Evers. Here's a tangent. One of the worst debates I ever saw in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Evers won, Barnes lost. T it tells you that debates don't matter anymore. Uh, editorial endorsements don't really matter anymore. Polling, you know, it's a hard. It's hard to get people on the phone right now. I think that's one of the problems pollsters have, uh, and a lot of people don't want to answer the phone, mm -hmm. or they don't want to answer an electronic poll. So I don't. I think their methods are uh, unreliable right now. In the picture that they are portraying, uh, is distorted even right up to election day. Because I, when I woke up Tuesday morning, uh, you know, I was bracing for. Uh, outcomes, really nasty outcomes that I don't want to see happen. Uh, and they all didn't come true. Uh, and it's just, it's, I do think it, I, I don't like the polls. I wish there weren't that many polls. I wish the polls would stop polling, you know, a couple of weeks before the election. And um, I, I just think it's very unreliable. I mean, I, I'm sure Hillary Clinton thinks it's unreliable too. Well, one of the things I think, too, about the money in the campaigns is that a lot of money goes in to paying for polling. I mean, every candidate has uh, pollsters uh, working for them. And then, you know, there's just a lot of money that goes into that. I recently heard Charles Franklin, uh, who does the Marquette poll, speaking, and he says they seek 800 respondents. And that for the last, next to last poll they did, uh, they made 154,000 phone calls to get the 800 uh, because of, as you were articulating, uh, people don't answer the phone and so forth. They also do not put their uh, title uh, in the telephone answering thing is, do you know you, that you don't know that it's the Marquette polling people until you answer the phone and then right away they say who they are. But he says that they they probably call most people three or four times, dial that number uh, before they answer, and a lot of course never do. But I thought that was quite interesting. One hundred fifty four thousand uh, uh, calls they made to get eight hundred people. So uh, that they, I mean, it's hard for me to do the math in my head, but I think it's <laughs> like they have to make two hundred calls to get to one to get one answer. Yeah, so that, yeah. You know, and then. Yeah. The people who are answering, are they representative in any kind of a way? I mean, if I get a phone number on my phone and I don't know that number, yeah. I'm not answering that phone. And so well, this, it, yeah. it's, it's very tricky. Yeah, they they considered by not putting the, uh, the name of the organization where you could see it before you answered, that that has a, a relation to cutting out some bias. You know, so I don't know. But I, it's certainly, it's gotten more and more obvious that uh, polling is off, but yet there's just polling done all the time, and people, you know, sort of uh, use that to say if somebody's, you know, doing well or not going to do well, etc. Here's another question uh, someone has about: Does Minnesota have a roof on campaign funding? I got to plead ignorance here. I don't know the Minnesota law. Deborah might, but I don't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, someone also comments that uh, they think Soros may be the uh, organization that finances uh, open secrets. So, uh, but Joe took that back. He said it's not in their Soros isn't in their disclosures. So. Okay. 
another person saying, what can we do to get candidates to express what they stand for? Many give no responses to our uh, questions. Yeah, and, and that's unbelievable to me that they won't respond to a League of Women Voters survey or like Van Orden won't even do a debate. I mean, are you going to tell the public who you are and what you stand for? Or are you just going to you know, run ads on TV and radio and, and hide from people? So I think that's uh, very regrettable. I, I, I think you should hound the candidates whenever they are uh, in public, if they ever do, you know, office hours or town hall meetings or whatever they call them, you know, and say, answer the League of Women Voters uh, questionnaire about what issues you stand for. Uh, I do think it's important to go to candidates' websites. You can find out a lot at their websites, sometimes by reading between the lines and sometimes by actually uh, reading what they print there. Uh, and that's better than listening to the ads, certainly. And if someone has, uh, asks, what can we do tomorrow, Matt? Well, I mean, tom tomorrow, I think uh, you should start talking to your neighbors and friends or maybe you should wait till Monday, uh, you know, <laughs> about the election that's coming up in April for Wisconsin Supreme Court, because that's a, a huge race, which will have tremendous influence about uh, how Wisconsin goes forward on campaign finance, on gerrymandering, on a whole range of issues. But I do think, uh, you know, letting people relax and breathe for a couple of days is important before you start uh, trying to educate them about the importance of that race. It'd be great if we had another, uh, huge turnout in April on that decisive court race. And then here's something that I, I believe strongly in that we all can do tomorrow. And that is just have a conversation with someone uh, who disagrees with you politically, uh, but is not uh, but uh, but is in your social circle and is not someone that you find uh, to be dangerous, that actually uh, you like in some ways, you respect in some ways, they see the world differently and vote differently than the way you vote for. I think it's really important for, number one, for civil dialogue and uh, civic health in a democracy that we don't demonize people automatically who, who vote a way that we don't like. And here we are in Wisconsin, you know, half the people vote one way, half the people vote another way. Are we gonna really, really write off, uh, you know, half the people who didn't vote the way you voted? I just think that is, uh, uh, the wrong approach, a bad approach for a healthy democracy. I also think it's bad politics because what you want to do, whichever political persuasion you're from, is not only get your base out, but convince a portion of people who don't already agree with you that your view of what is just and right and beautiful about America is a better way than the other side is offering. And so I, I'm trying to do this. I've been trying to do this, especially since Trump came on the scene, uh, to talk to people I know. Uh, and just not beat them over the head, not call them names, not call them stupid, uh, uh, not even talk politics with them right away, but try to meet people on some shared value terrain. Uh, you know, what you do in common, are they in your religious, are they in your church, your synagogue, your mosque, are they in your book club, are they in your exercise club, are they in your poker group, like that's where I find some of these folks. And just try to uh, engage them in conversation about the things you have in common, and then, you know, listen to them. It's really important to listen to people. You know, one of the best organizers in Wisconsin is a woman who works at Souls to the Polls named Anita Johnson. Anita Johnson's a great organizer, and I was at a, uh, a seminar, in-person seminar, a few years ago when some young person was flown in from Washington to tell everybody how to knock on doors. And Anita Johnson's been knocking on doors for like 50 years. And this young person was telling everybody how to knock on doors and what script to use. And I, and I knew Anita was getting annoyed. And finally, Anita raised her hand and said, you know, that's not how we do it here. What, what, what we do or what I do is I go knock on a door and I ask the person who answers the door, what's on your mind? What issues do you care about the most before going into any spiel and maybe never even getting to the spiel, just listening to the person and trying to connect with that person. And so, you know, I'm all for listening to people who I don't agree with. Not everybody. I'm not talking about someone who's flying a Confederate flag or has a swastika 
tattoo on their arm or the guy at the poker game two weeks ago who wore a sweatshirt that said, give violence a chance. That person, I'm not going to persuade. And that person's a little scary. <laughs> but I'm talking about people, you know, you have a decent already established relationship with and and we need to listen to each other and we need to lower the rhetoric and we need to uh you know politically try to bring people around to a, a pro-democracy pro-justice agenda you know matt uh, it's interesting you comment that because i have been of the opinion that some of what has happened nationally started back uh when newt gingrich was speaker uh, at that time, when the people were elected to Congress and in, in the same time he was, they began to talk about, you know, changing things in Washington. And at that time in Washington, uh, people would on weekends, for example, uh, play poker with each other and play golf with each other and so forth. But after he came in, they began having this whole idea that they didn't stay in Washington. They came home every Thursday evening or Friday morning and they went back to Washington on Monday. They had no ways to get acquainted with each other and to know each other. I can well remember when Paul Ryan was first elected and I was lobbying in Washington and we went into his office and his staff was appalled because he, of course, was a big um, a person who went to the gym every morning and he would go to the gym every morning, come in his office and he slept in his office. He never, ever rented a place in Washington. His office smelled like a gym <laughs> until they began hanging his clothes out the window. But yeah. in any event, it, you know, people didn't uh, then interact with each other because they kept coming home every weekend and so forth. And they didn't do what you're saying. They didn't have these times where they just sat down and talked with each other and talked about things that maybe they agreed on, not things they disagreed on. And I, I think that has made a tremendous difference in terms of, of our national uh, scene now and what's happened in these ensuing years. You know, I, I think you're totally right all across the board, Melanie, first of all, uh, in targeting or putting your finger on Newt Gingrich, because I did, do think he started it all. Uh, but this era, era we're in of, of mutual demonization has really uh, got to stop. I mean, I saw an illustration of it. There was a YouTube video of Marjorie Taylor Greene going uh, outside the office of, of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and just just harassing her and calling her all sorts of names and you know it's just what that, that's just no way to be and uh i also think you know it's not the way to act in a democracy it's not the way to act in a civil society and uh, you know i've been very worried over the last five years that our civil society is going down the tubes because of this demonization that's been going on and I, i'm a little uh less scared after Tuesday, because I think, uh, you know, it was nice to see people concede on both sides, you know, who actually lost an election. And this idea that, uh, you know, every time you lose, you've got to cry foul. I mean, we have people who are screaming at the refs, you know, in the parking lot two years after the game ended. I mean, th that's just ridiculous. Matt, thank you so much. Uh, it's been wonderful to have you with us. It's been wonderful to have the opportunity to ask you questions and to dialogue with each other. So we really do appreciate your time and appreciate all of your wisdom that you've shared with us. And so I will now return uh, our evening back over to Deborah. I just want to say thank you very much for hearing me out. And I will share my script. I'll pass it on to Molly and she can send it to everybody. And uh, if you want to, uh, it won't be word for word, but it'll be close. Well, thank you again. Thanks and then uh, instead of Deborah, let's uh, conclude with Dorothy. Yeah, that, thanks, Matt, so much for uh, updating and, and re-energizing us to succeed in, in solving the problem of money in politics and, and uh, in our elections by enacting campaign finance reform. I just have, I have one last question kind of rolling off the Tuesday results. Do you think the defeat of many candidates who were saying that the um, last presidential election was stolen and all this stuff is going to move things in the right direction. Is it going to, uh, for want of a better word, shut them up and, <laughs> and it improve the level of dialogue in our um, 
political arena? Uh, you know, I hope so. I mean, I saw uh, an article about Robin Voss today uh, who was suggesting that, you know, they got to move beyond Trump. Uh, they've got to co uh, he's for cooperating more with Governor Evers. And I think those are two healthy signs. Little, little bit of movement. <laughs> yeah. All right, then we will, uh, as we've said, we'll post this recording on the LWVWI uh, website. Thanks to all of you in attendance for your attention and your good questions. And please zoom back in on Saturday morning at 9 a.m. when part two of our issues briefing will focus on social justice and in particular on the fight for women's rights. It's gonna be another superb program and hope to see you all then. And with that, I'll just say, good night, everybody. Take care. Yeah.